Greetings and salutations to all you folks out there. We've got a one versus one for you today. This one is going to be on Niflheim, however you pronounce this, Niflheim Final 2. I would be tempted to say that it is an elvish name, but we all know that the elves live in the deep green forest, and this is a forsaken, barren Iceland. So, yeah. Do what you will with that. Pietros is on the top left side. He is taking UEF exactly the same as Commander Adama on the bottom right. Red versus blue. This is a ladder match between two relatively even players. 15-15 versus a 16-8 something. 1680s. So they're within about 100 points of each other, give or take a few. This map is a highly entertaining one to play on and watch because there's multiple levels of activity going on. You've got the central plane, which has a fair bit of reclaim right next to the bait, which is going to let these guys jumpstart their early economy. You can see Pietros is going first land, second air, your traditional run of power generators. Actually, he is going for six, seven. There we go. Yes, seven. Six is a little bit scarce, but it can be done with some tree reclaim. Commander Adama is doing very nearly exactly the same thing. Seven P-Gens, first land, second air, and expanding with a couple of engineers. So on the first main level of this map, that's where you're going to see most of your land encounters. And there are three main access points, which are just separated enough that point defense is kind of inefficient. You can't build enough point defense at all three openings to stop mobile units coming through the other side. Add to that the fact that you have a gaping hole in the back of your base, which is reached by the plateau on the second level. There's some mass extractors up here, some solid expansions. You're wanting, you're going to want to get units out there, and if you're only focusing on fully frontal attack, then it's not really going to work out for you. And then you've got the top tier, which you've got to drop on to get. There's three mass extractors up there on each side. Not necessarily of huge strategic importance, but you can build things up there that can harass the back end of the base, and it can get kind of hysterical at some points. We do have a little bit of early harassment going on. Mechmarine headed out for Pietros. That little, guy, that little guy is going to just scuttle across the map here on the back side, hoping to pick up an engineer, I am sure, on that back run of territory. There is going to be a striker intercepting, though, so he is not going to get very far. And then a striker moving out to the left as well, which is going to be another uh, mech marine scout pair on this side. So a little bit of aggression, a little bit of a more high-octane stance for Pietros. He's trying to get out there and snipe off some things. A little bit more defensive play from Commander Adama. Getting out his main combat units, just trying to protect the engineers that he has out. Commander Adama at the moment is looking at 15 mass per take income versus 9 for Pietros. And that is pretty much what careful expansion, focusing on getting your engineers out, will get you. On a map this size, you have to basically go mech marines before anything else to get them all the way across before the tanks can come out. Because when you got a little bit of a distance to walk, of course, by the time you get all the way over there, they're going to have their own combat units to deal with what you throw at them. Expansion is going down in the back. We've got a land factory building on the cliff there that is going to let them build engineers, snag those mass extractors, and even the little bit of reclaim that's up here. I know you wouldn't think that you could get mass out of the snow, but apparently the 3D printers in the Subcom universe can use anything including water to build the units that they need to build. So yeah, that is a, going to be a vital resource. Engineers going for the reclaim and success. That is going to be a mech marine denial right behind the base there. Got a tank coming around the left with unfortunately nothing nearby and I don't think he is uh, no, there's no intelligence. So he is probably going to be able to kill that engineer, possibly a mass extractor or two before he is dealt with. Got a bomber out. Looks like four land factories going down and scout to follow with an interceptor already out on this side. Again, right about the same thing. Bombers out, couple of interceptors and a scout as well. So these guys are going neck and neck, meeting up in the mid in just a second with the ACUs it looks like. And we're going on factory number four with a lot more planned for Pietros, ACU moving down and to the left for Pietros and up and to the right for Commander Adama. Well, ah, bombers even passing each other as they are flying to each other's bases. That engineer is just barely going to get out alive. 19 health left. 
not encountering every single napalm strike that that bomber's throwing down. Two interceptors gonna drop it, no problemo. And again, symmetrical expansion. Got a land factory going down in the back. When you see 1,500 plus ladder players both doing the same thing with the same faction on a map, then you can pretty much assume that they know the meta. This is a good build order to probably copy. Generally follow the same patterns and you should do pretty well for yourself. A single tank encountering three. Actually, that was two, but they were spaced out. Not going to end well for the single tanks. We all know how streaming units go versus the clumped up units. As far as everything else on the map is concerned, it looks like we are pretty much just seeing standard poking and prodding that we see at this level. A little bit of an engagement there with a couple of tanks. The narrow passes make it a little bit difficult to slip anything by anyone. You've basically got to distract them in one area, make them move all their units, to one side and then push your units around the other, which we're seeing a little bit of right here. There are two tanks and a scout on this side ready to respond should anything threaten those engineers, but there are three and a scout on this side paired with a couple engineers to pick up all of those mass extractors. There's actually quite a significant amount along with this extra mass that we were talking about earlier. All right, we've actually got a land factory going down for Pietros on the second level on both sides. There's a single air factory over here. Maybe we'll see a factory at some point, but for now it's just a reclaim order over there. So Pietros is actively pushing out land units to the side. His production is way higher, far higher than Commander Adama's is. Let's look at the reclaim here real quick. Ah, bombers on the tanks. Always awesome to nail those T1 units as they're clumped up, especially if you, if you have a pass to work with. That can help you condense those units damaging six, seven, eight at a time instead of one or two. So Commander Adama has 3,800 in the bag for reclaim, and it looks like his income is hovering around 30. Pietros doing a nice job trying to kill these mass extractors. That bomb is actually going to friendly fire the mass extractor because the tank stopped and it was bombing in front. Will it get the kill? Yes. Two mexes down for Pietros. Um, he has got 4,800 reclaim to 4,800. So these guys running neck and neck and 36 income to 33. So everything should be exactly symmetrical between these two players. Pietros has shedded about half of his health shed about half of his health is shed a word i don't think it is i'm sure that bell would be furious with me for my incredibly bad english um tanks moving in unfortunately the same principle that applies to the bombers also applies to t1 artillery normally i would say that large amounts of uef t1 artillery is a mistake but in this specific instance it is actually working because when all of the tanks get clumped up in the gap those Lobo shells are devastating. They've got just enough AOE and plenty of damage to put down some serious hurt on those groups of tanks. Although with that many, it is getting a little bit questionable. There are two point defense in the back, so that is going to force Pietros to build some T1 artillery, but he's just going to leave his units and let them get slaughtered. So many tanks and already dying in that volley. Commander Adama just pouring artillery shells down on the head of Pietros' forces. We do have a land factory over here finally with a point defense to kind of secure this little area. Engineer going to get out there and get those mass extractors and a little bit of a run by here. It is going to slip. It looks like... Pietros is not paying enough attention, but those guys are, for some reason, just going to kind of get stuck on the wall there. I'm not sure where they were trying to move to, but artillery shot is going to take some of them out. On the south side, it's always a mistake to land your interceptors. No! There are six or so interceptors that have gone down to land unit fire. I know that red has got plenty of air, but you still don't want to throw away your units like that. It is bad news. Four engineers dropped on the north side. That is going to give Commander Adama an opportunity to expand. He's going to throw down a land factory, adjusting it there as you saw, and he's going to cap those mexes in order to claim that income and possibly shove over on to the other side of the map. Nice little run by here for Pietros, which is going to get slaughtered 
by Commander Adama, who is pushing out T2 units, Mongeese up on the shelf. So Adama was not as intent on expanding to those shelves early in the game. Ooh, beautiful kill by the T1 bomber. That was a nice reaction up there for Pietros. Um, but he is definitely making up for lost time in that regard because he has got units moving around the back end. He has got T2 on the shelf. He is doing his level best to reclaim all of the resources that are at the person's disposal who owns these side shelves. He has broken out of the middle as well. Pietros is kind of rammed into the back corner. He is getting the gun upgrade. Not entirely sure. Personally, I think I would get the T2 upgrade, but what do I know? We'll let him do what he's going to do. Tanks coming out from a factory built there for Pietros, and that is going to eliminate everything right here. No problem. Looks like that's going to put uh, Pietros... Well, he is still in the lead. He is just over 50 mass per tick, and Commander Adama is sitting on 44. But that's the thing about pushing forwards into the map. As you roll your enemy back, you will uncover glorious reclaim to get for yourself. Looks like Pietros is sitting on 53 mass per tick, if I'm not totally mistaken. And 8,400 reclaim, 97 on 39 mass income for Commander Adama. That is kind of predictable that the reclaim number would be higher for red. T1 Bomber coming in, trying to kill off those units again with the expansion rating. Never give up on expansion rating because as long as you can be killing resources and pushing your opponent off balance, you are accomplishing good things in life. T2 rolling out on the right side as well. We have a support factory there. Support factory and the HQ in the center gap here. I'm really not sure about building that power generator way up front like that. That just seems like a huge risk for not much benefit to me. Um, I, I do build forward T2 P gens on occasion. I do realize that it is a very bad habit. But I try not to build T2 P gens when there is a commander and a clump of units like maybe a couple hundred yards away. That just seems like a bad idea to me. Maybe I'm wrong. Hello, raiding engineer. If expansioneers are engineers that are expanding, what do we call raiding engineers? Rangerneers? I don't know. Maybe I'm trying too hard to come up with a cutesy little name. All right, five NGs dropped on the north side. Once that factory goes down, that means that Red will have complete and total control of the south plateau. That will give him almost exactly 50-50 mass control, map control. Unfortunately, he is somewhat behind on Eco, but he is ahead on Reclaim, so I think he can make up the difference fairly easily. Pietros is on 9,700 Reclaim and 11,000 plus for Commander Adama, so a couple thousand mass points ahead. I think at 15 minutes into the game, that might be able to make up for a fair bit of mass discrepancy, but Pietros is pushing up his income. Well, no, 43. 43, we're going to go with 43. Reclaim makes everything so unreliable. T1 Force is moving over on the south side for Pietros. This... He just is really determined to make this die. This is a thorn in his side. He's like, I cannot sleep at night while the enemies own this location. I must destroy it. I absolutely must. Even if there are T2 units in the way, I'm just going to eat away at them with a T1 bomber until they fall away. And then I will finally be able to take the glorious victory over those two mass extractors that I have been killing over and over all game. But I don't think these units are up to it. I think they're finally going to get pushed back. Pietros is overcharging his way out of a mess on this side. Is that? Yes, that is a Riptide. Why are there Riptides on the map? They do good damage. They're very, very fast. But when you're engaging with main battle tanks, they just don't have the HP to stay in the game. T2 units coming in for Commander Adama on the back side as well. Adama, Adama is going to do a bit of damage here, and he is actually dropping engineers on this side to go ahead, grab that reclaim, grab those mass extractors, do awesome things to that expansion. 
and he's got T2 tanks in the back end of the base. So overall, things are looking fairly good for Commander Adama, even though he is significantly behind in score. He is doing very well in regards to map control and harassing his enemy. A couple of T2 tanks in the group in the middle. I really sincerely believe that those Riptides are a mistake because Riptides simply can't keep up with pillars and while you may be able to use that extra speed to get around the back side of the map, there is absolutely no reason for a Riptide to be in the middle because there's nowhere to run, there's no way to skirt, no way to kite. You can't get anywhere because everything is through these three narrow channels. So every advantage that the Riptide has is stripped away. Maybe it was a mistake building those. I don't know. Maybe he uh, misclicked on his Q. But that is a factory. Yeah, that thing is only building Riptides. So if it was a mistake, it is a very long-lived one. T1 Bombers coming in. Those are probably going to go for the P-Gen here. Maybe for the build power. I could understand the T2 Engineer. Looks like it is going after the TAC Launcher. Beautiful target. Awesome kill. Was he able to get any shots off with it? I don't think so. If he was, the TMD killed it. So no losses there for Pietros. Well done, sir. Well done. Oh, man. That forward T2P gen is going to be the death of him. 200 HP left. T1 Bomber coming in. And it's living. If the ACU had not started repairing when it did, that P-Gen would have gone down. Commander Adama is barely going to keep that thing alive. And on the right side, it looks like his attempts at an expansion have finally gone south. We've got a group of pillars sitting on top of what once was his T2 support factory. They are wiping out all of the eco on that right side. But in the middle, Pietros is cornering a group of pillars that may have been forgotten about. It looks like they were issued a move order and are just kind of stuck there. Had they carried on, they may have been able to slip around the back just a little bit. But I think that was an incursion that was kind of doomed from the start. Three more pillars on the north. Probably going to get a pile of engineer kills here. Let's see, four kills, one kill. Quite an impressive amount for a T2 unit. It's funny how as the tiers go up, the veterancy exponentially increases. Because a one, a tier one unit getting one single vet on it is awesome. And it rarely happens. Okay, maybe not rarely, but you don't see it that much. Getting vet on a T2 unit is a little bit easier but you don't really see them with that high of a kill count. Then you'll get T3 units that have like 50 kills sometimes. And then, of course, T4s. But, yeah, I guess that has to do with the overall survivability of the unit. When you have tons more HP to burn through, even though you're dealing with equally high damage and HP units at the same tier, it just gives you a little bit longer to hang around the map. T2 moving around the outside edge for Pietros there. This is interesting. Is there intel over here for either player? There is not. That is why everyone looks like they're stabbing around in the dark, because they are. It's two blind men dancing a jig and colliding in the center when they come for the meetup. That's exactly what that is. T1 Bombers, good lord. Odama is just having his butt handed to him by T1 Bombers at the moment. Losing his TMD. T1 Bombers doing a fair little bit of damage right there, and Pietros is still building T1 Bombers, which, hey, why not? Absolutely, you should build something that is working so well. He's building... He's only got two air factories, and they're both building bombers. Forget the interceptors. We only need one pass. Kamikaze Bombers are completely and totally the way to go. T2 Tanks moving over to the right side edge. A single mobile flak would make a huge difference right there. There was about to be a drop, and that thing actually got loaded, but the interceptors sniped it off. Unfortunately, there was a mobile flak. This is why you have mobile flak. There was a flak right there, and it was able to take out about a third of the interceptors for Pietros in that one little pass. Skyboxers are brutal when it comes to dealing with T1 air units. 
handy dandy mobile missile launchers going to walk directly into the range of Commando Commander Adama's comm. I'm not sure why those were stuck in so close, seeing as they cannot defend themselves, but that was a beautiful overcharge right there. Three kills, and that commander is going to back up just a little bit or moving in when he has another overcharge ready, I would assume. I would hope. Because you don't want to overextend your commander versus T2 units. Move its units coming in from the side. Looks like a lot of T2, more bombers, and they are now officially dealt with. No use in building those anymore. We've got lots of mobile flak online for Commander Adama, and he does have his P gens under his shield, even though they are on the front edge of his base. So I think he will be fine from here on out. T2 units pack a surprising punch. Unless you're overcharging over and over again, um, T2 units can kill your commander incredibly quickly. So I, it just makes me nervous when people leave their comms out front like this when they do not have the gun upgrade because it makes it so much harder to effectively engage those T2 units. On the north side, beautiful run by going on. Commander Adama was able to slip all the way around the outside edge, get together enough units to actually ram a hole through Pietros' defense. He's going to knock out those T2 mass extractors in the back. Pietros has been ahead on Eco for a little while now. 66 to 43, 21,000 reclaim to 25,000. So Commander Adama still ahead in reclaim. But uh, that's going to knock him down a peg. We're now looking at 62 income for Pietros. I do like the flapjack spam, but I can't help but wonder if this is a cybern player typically. I don't know. Pietros does do a lot of UEF, I think. There is T3. Been waiting for it to hit the field. T3 for him and halfway to T3 for Commander Adama. I always think of Cybern when I see mobile missile launcher spam. I do realize that it has its uses no matter the faction, and here we see one of them. Going to kill that T2 point defense before it can fire a single shot along with an engineer. The uh, flapjacks are just so much less useful. They pretty much, you have to use them on stationary targets and their firing speed is not high enough to actually overwhelm things. Whereas Cybern TMD is firing so often that you're able to actually just blindly fire into crowds of units and you will be able to do a substantial amount of damage even though the shots are not tracking. That is an exercise in futility. Two pillars going to die to T1 bombers because they couldn't move even though they couldn't even shoot the factory there. Hate to see stuff like that happen. Kind of a face palm moment, but it's okay. These guys can deal. Got a nicely mixed T2 or army over here for Commander Adama. I love it when people use mobile shields. I really, really, truly do. This is a well-prepared force. All it's missing is a little bit of anti-air, but when your opponent doesn't have that much air that you know of, yeah, you can probably get away with not really having much or any. But th with this amount of interceptors, I would kind of start getting nervous as red because typically people shift to combat production when they have such an obviously superior number of air units, of interceptors to be exact. That was an attempted drop with a T1 transport, but hello flak, which is also going to take out or at least damage a large portion of those interceptors. T2 bombers coming in, gonna wipe out a T2 mass extractor, probably pick up a second. It's gonna be a nice little raid, nice bonus for Pietros. These guys seem to be very, very evenly matched. Toe to toe, all the way, raiding each other's ecos to keep them in line with each other and really just kind of poking and prodding and doing all the kind of same things except on opposite sides of the map. Red at the moment seems to be holding a little bit of an advantage on map control. He is pushing in on the left. He's already secured over half on the right side. So I think we're probably going to start seeing a little bit of a shift to where Commander Adam is ahead. He just passed in the scoreboard, actually. He needs to get all of these mass extractors, and he's got to deal with the bomber if he's going to hold all of this. But he has the potential for so much more eco. At the moment, we have a T3 mass extractor upgrade going down 
for Pietros back in base, which is kind of hilarious. I don't know that I have seen a T3 mass extractor on this map before. Typically, games don't go this long on this map. But we do have some Percivals moving in on Pietro's commander, which, if I remember correctly, is gun upgraded. Yes, it is. He has got gun upgrade and tier 2 on that guy. Um, that's not going to be quite so bad, but still, Percivals outrange the commander, if I'm not mistaken. And they do deal buttloads of damage. Overcharge is going to take out two at a time. If he doesn't separate those, yep, there we go. Four kills for Pietros. That is awesome. Percival moving around the backside, though. He is going to be able to focus fire that point defense, take it out in two shots, and then probably take out that one as well if he were to so choose. But he is not. He is going to withdraw and wait on reinforcements. A little bit of a run by on the right. Pietros, let's see, he is building Titans, which is definitely unique. You typically don't see people going for Titans because Titans are horrifically bad. Mass for mass versus basically any other unit or unit type. So he is building the weaker of the UEF units by far and dealing with everything on the left side of the map Oh my word, that's a lot of Percivals. Run! Run! You've already got five vet, 5,000 health. The vet saved him, but goodness gracious alive, that was close. Percivals queuing up those point defense, killing off a shield before he can get it up. I think, had he focus fired these Percivals, the three Percivals here, Pietros would already be dead. He is currently trying to build a shield generator, but he is mass stalled like all get out. Still building a T3P gen with a T3 engineer, which is why he can't really get any mass. He's trying to reclaim what he needs. Man, that is rough. He needs that T3P gen for power. He is on 31,000 reclaim with 61 income, whereas Commander Adama is on high 50s mass income and 49,000 reclaim. So a huge, huge lead for Commander Adama, even though he is not that much different on mass income. And I think that's where this entire lead is coming from as far as his unit count goes. We've got Titans moving up on the left side. Those are going to actually take advantage of their speed Literally the only thing the Titan has going for it is speed. Those are going to zip out to the back of the base, do a little damage, kill a power generator. Everybody loves to kill power once in a while. And those Titans are going to move around towards the back of the map. Point defense makes me sad. It protects you from the front and not from the back. So if anything moves in this plateau, which these guys are apparently, or if anything runs by on the side, yes, the ACU is going to move over, but he's going to take a terrifying amount of damage in the process down below 3,000 health, at least temporarily, and he's going to lose that T3P gen that he just uh, invested so many tears. I was going to go after blood, sweat, and tears, and that entire metaphor just fell apart as I was saying it. So power stall for Pietros. Commander Adama sitting pretty on top of his massive mountain of reclaim. It pays to be a hoarder in Supreme Commander. Perhaps if we were doing the child-friendly version of Eco Whore, it would be Eco Hoarder, and I think it would be roughly the same meaning. Pietros does have the T3 tech. He doesn't have a T3 ACU, but he does have T3 thanks to the HQ of his very, very own. And there goes a bunch of bombers. Man, that was a concentrated napalm blast right there. Going after the P-Gens. Another P-Gen going down. Energy storage definitely making that a lot easier with that 1,000 area of effect damage. Pietros is doing great at getting units around to the back. He's got all of this in the base. He's going to be able to raid that eco, basically eliminate all of the income that Commander Adama has. But his ACU is now directly under attack. He cannot maintain enough power to actually run his shield generators. And still terrifying devastation happening back on his base. 
Oh, man. It's only a matter of time until those guys target that ACU and this game is over. But he does need to do it quickly. Pietro's down on 17 mass income because of power stall. But Commander Adama is down sub 50 again thanks to all of that rating. So even when you're on your back foot, even when you feel like you're losing, you need to actively be rating and eliminating things just on the offside chance that you don't die. I was thinking that was very, very likely for a few minutes there, but Pietros has finally dipped to the 2000 mark in HP and he simply cannot get any more shields up. And this is where, mm, Pietros is down. This is where I can see so many ways that Pietros could have not died. And it would have been better if he had been building mobile flak. He has all of his factories off. And for at least, what, two minutes? All of those bombers are just flying around his base. He could have been building mobile flak. I know that he was worried about power stall, but I really think it would have been worth the power stall long term to go ahead after the flak. Because as we can see... The bombers weren't focused on the ACU anyway. So, yeah, 420 power is definitely enough to pump out a couple of flak out of the T3 factory, which is going to build the fastest, and he would be able to do a ton of damage to that cloud of bombers and potentially bring this back. That being said, it would have been hard to bring back because there are a lot of T3 units on the field for Commander Adama, and he has a huge amount of air. There's already point defense in the base, so I think Pietros would have been relatively safe from the T3. And since it's T3 point defense, no need to be worried about those mobile missile launchers. But overall, well done to both of these guys. Commander Adama definitely securing the upper hand for the last portion of that game. I think we can all learn something from a game like this. This is pretty standard, even ranking ladder matches where the slightest mistakes, the slightest differences in how you carry out your plans can make the difference between a loss and a victory. So I hope you guys enjoyed this game. I do have a quick announcement about Saturday. I completely forgot about this when I was doing the live cast, but I am not going to be here this Saturday. There is no live cast on Saturday. I'm going to be out of town way far away, 10 hours from my computer and really with no ability to stream anything because the house that I'm going to does not have an internet connection. So yeah, I'm going to be out. I'm going to make up a live cast at the beginning of next week. Hope some of you guys at least can tune in for that. And then we'll be back on the normal schedule for next Saturday. I'm going to try to get one extra cast in to have some content for you guys on Saturday so you're not completely left out, but we'll just see how that works out between tonight and tomorrow before I leave. Alrighty, guys, as always, thank you so much for watching, and I will see you in the next one.